Hello everybody, today I am driving a 2016 BMW 230i and I'm quite excited about this for a number of different reasons. I have recently driven a car very similar to this one, an M240i, so you'd think that there wouldn't really be an awful lot different between this and that, and on the face of it you would be right. Granted a, a few cosmetic changes and some spec ones too, this has the larger nav screen which is much better. It also has the Brakes Plus package, which means it gets the same brakes as the M240i. And it also has the standard Alcantara interior with blue stitching and accents, which I have to say, actually does look quite nice. These seats are the first surprise because they are extremely tightly bolstered. I mean, around the small of my back, this thing really grabs you. I'd say, in fact, it, it could be perhaps a little too tight, and this may be a result of the fact that my frame is no doubt wider than that of Peter's, the very kind man who's brought this car today. The vast majority of boring, ordinary things that I would have to say about this car are exactly the same as they are in the 240, unsurprisingly. Interior room is okay. The seats are canted over at a very weird, odd angle, meaning that my right thigh is basically sat on the bolster. Boot space is pretty good, and rear space is acceptable, if not excellent. This car was specced from new by Peter, and he chose this for a few very interesting reasons that I'd never previously considered. He has had a number of very cool Japanese cars in the past, a Nissan Primera GT, an S15 Silvia Spec R. So to him, a decent performance car can have a four-cylinder engine with about 250 horsepower like this one. In power terms, it's actually very slightly down on my 130i, which has the old naturally aspirated three-litre six-cylinder. It is, however, a bit up on torque. This is an extremely close relative of the B58 in the M240i, and also the B18 or B38 or whatever they call it, the three-cylinder 1.5-litre engine you'll find in stuff like the Mini. The sole modification made to this car is the equipment of some Bilstein B6 shock absorbers. The springs are as original. I believe the Bilstein kit is designed to work with the OEM springs should you want it to. A good friend of Peter's is apparently the princess and the pea when it comes to suspension, and he used to run this setup on his car, which he then sold and gave to Peter, who has been very happy with it. You might not expect that somebody buying a 230i rather than an M2 or a 240 would want to take a car on track, but in fact, Peter has done so at least five times, so points to him for doing that. In the M240i video, I said that you could not disable auto rev matching in the car, which apparently was incorrect. I held down the traction control button in here for a few seconds, and that should have turned auto rev match off. Although I'm not sure that it did. I was in sport mode. I've now put it into sport plus. So I'm just going to see if you can actually let it allow you to rev match and heel and toe for yourself. In all fairness, BMW system is actually quite good, but I just would like to see how easily that I can do it, because it's a really good way of judging how well the engine actually responds to your inputs. Well, I've got this car in sport plus mode with dynamic traction control on and uh, Yep, so it's only with traction control fully off that this thing will actually allow me really to heel and toe myself. I am going to leave dynamic traction control on because the road conditions today are generally good but not perfect. So I want to explore what the car's like with traction control on and then should I really want to, I'll turn it off in a bit. The ride on these B6s is still somewhat jittery at low speeds. This is a reasonably well-paved piece of sort of town road, I guess you could call it. And yeah, if anything, I'd say the car might be firmer than the old M240i. This car is, no, I, I don't like this at all. Allow me to explain why in just a moment. I want to try that again and, and see what happens. The 
the engine, funnily enough, I don't really have any problems with at all. In fact, I think it's a really sweet little power plant. It's very responsive. There isn't really so much a turbo lag, just a, a small moment while the turbo builds, but it's fine, it's responsive enough, and actually I think it might be a little bit better on that front than the B58. Uh, that could be entirely a placebo effect, but I feel like this is a, a more keen, more ready-to-go engine. Like the bigger engine, though, there's no particular reward for revving it out beyond about 4,500, 5,000 RPM, but it makes up for that by having really quite admirable punch through the mid-range. As much as I hate to admit it, this is actually a sort of a good replacement for the old 3-litre straight six. No, I don't prefer it over that engine. I still think the old one is absolutely marvellous and magnificent. But if we have to do these things, then this is that process done right. Unfortunately, the move to a 2-litre four-cylinder hasn't really yielded the improvements in fuel economy that you might expect. This car has done an average over the 50 odd thousand miles it's been owned of about 33 and a half to the gallon. Not really very good when you think that the M240i will do basically the same. So what is my problem with this car? Well, it's the way it goes down a road like this. There is something absolutely brilliant and wonderful about this car, perhaps even more so than the 240i, and that's almost certainly down to the suspension. However, it's also the suspension and chassis setup that, that really is ruining things for me. this particular section the car is actually doing okay but it's when the road gets just that little bit more demanding the entire thing falls apart and even here it's far from brilliant that suspension does eventually get a little bit of suppleness come through to it it does eventually begin to work with the road you need to be really pressing on I'm doing the speed limit here through some fairly tight bends and that's really what you need to do and the front end is certainly very keen no doubt benefited a little bit from the weight saving you'll inevitably get with lopping two cylinders off the front of a car but this is a car with a real identity problem. There are many different ways that a car can cope with a road. Now, some can be somewhat aloof, very disconnected, still very capable, and they just sort of get down the road quickly, but you're not really very involved with it. Others want to sort of jitter and move and shake around and follow every single little nook and cranny that they can find. However, they also give you that driver involvement, that feel, that feedback, that fizz, that ridiculously hyperactive helm. That is the sort of thing that, say, uh, a Ford Racing Puma is like. Not actually really the fastest way to get down the road. Not a car with even that high an ability level, but one that communicates what's going on so clearly to you, you can have an awful lot of fun with it. This, though, kind of matches not necessarily the worst of both worlds, but elements of both that make no real sense. Once you've got a road with a, a bit of camber in the middle, this thing will just try and follow it, so that the, the car is trying to sort of dart all over the place. But as you can see, this is still a fairly softly sprung thing. So watch here, right? And look at look at look at how much it shakes. I'm just doing one quick sort of uh, jerk movement. So imagine your moose test type thing, but half of it. So I'm just going to jerk right and go straight. Like, okay, maybe I exaggerate that a little bit with my body, but look. Like, that, it's, the whole thing is still somewhat unsettled. You can still feel the anti-roll bars are reasonably soft. You can still feel the suspension has softness to it. It just doesn't have that kind of keen edge. But it feels like it's trying to. So when I went down that first section of the road, it all went completely wrong for me because I felt like the car is kind of being dragged this way and that. But the steering is so completely devoid of any meaningful feel, I don't really know what's going on. I should have a telepathic connection with the car through this wheel, knowing exactly what's going on, exactly what it's doing, exactly what its evil plans are for me. But yet, I don't. I know something's going on at the front, but I just don't trust it. And that means you just can't really get sort of close to that edge. Now, an example of a car that had some of these issues but dealt with them very well the Jaguar XE. That had a ride that was pretty much at all times too firm but 
the steering was such that you had confidence in the car, and despite the fact it was like a 1.8 ton executive car, you could throw it down the road like it was a hot hatch. This, you'd kind of want to do the same thing, and I feel parts of the car want to do that, but other parts are still trying to be a nice, decent, sensible, grown-up German car for nice, decent, sensible, grown-up people. It, it, it's all a, a little bit disconnected. It just doesn't make sense. I was talking with Peter about the Alpina D3 that I recently drove, and I think that's actually a car which managed to really marry these kind of two requirements of having fun but being sensible very well indeed. The chassis was very engaging, you could work with it, you knew what it was doing, you're still isolated enough so that on longer journeys it's not going to be irritating, because let's face it, you did not want to drive something like a Ford Racing Puma all the way up to Scotland. But this, on my favourite roads, it just... It just doesn't work. I can get it down the roads, but it's an exercise in faith. It really is. Yeah, here, it just... It does not know which way it wants to go. Pulls right, pulls left. Then you try and correct, but you correct too big because you just don't know what those front wheels are doing. All over the shop. I am going to recommend to Peter that he checks his geometry because it does feel very much like a car that has wild geo you know, wheels pointing wherever they want to, that kind of thing. Odd this. This is the kind of thing that happens when you are a car reviewer, because I came into it thinking the chassis and all that jazz was going to actually be quite nice and decent, but the engine I was going to hate. In fact, the engine, I think it's perfectly decent. I, I don't mind this engine at all. And if the M135i can actually have some of that real sort of fizz and excitement that a, a proper hot hatch does, it may well be a very good thing. I, I'm still not sure it's a... a "Quote unquote proper BMW, but yeah, this this is this is not what I'm looking for. There is other bad news as well. To buy new, this car wasn't actually that much cheaper, really, than an M240i. For some of the reasons previously mentioned, Peter decided he didn't want the M240i, and I think that's a perfectly understandable thing. He prefers to drive a slow car fast, and that's something I think most of us can get on board with. But he recently had it valued by BMW as a part exchange, and they offered him just over £10,000. So he has lost, essentially, two-thirds of the car's value in a very short space of time, despite the fact it is a relatively high-specification car. An M240i, I suspect, probably held onto its money just that much better. So actually, over the four years, you'd have found the M240i probably the cheaper car to run. If the fuel economy is basically the same, tax not really different enough to write home about, this is a car that just doesn't make a lot of financial sense. And as much as I'd like to say, like the M240i, this has been perfectly reliable, it hasn't, because this car is now on turbo number two. It isn't known why the first turbo was replaced. In fact, it hadn't really properly failed. The car had a boost issue. It wasn't making as much as it should, but it wasn't a catastrophic failure. BMW ran all their diagnostics and just said, yep, new turbo. Peter inquired as to what exactly was going on, and they just said, new turbo. So it got done, and that is slightly worrying, because you'd think that these would last a lot longer. I don't know if it's the same turbo as is used in the B58. I suspect there will be differences, because that car's larger engine and higher power output. But that's not the kind of thing you want to hear about a reasonably new car. I appreciate that there are people out there who may be looking at one of these because they simply can't have an M240i. As a used purchase, it is considerably cheaper. There will also be benefits in terms of insurance and all that kind of jazz. But this particular example, right here, right now, I'm afraid does have to get a bit of a thumbs down from me because I just don't know what it wants to be. I think it needs a lot more mods. That, that would be my temptation. Treat it like the Japanese cars that Peter used to own. Do more with it. Get some stiffer anti-roll bars on there. Get some more stuff done to it. Whether this steering will ever have any feel through it, I really couldn't say. I have my suspicions that it won't. But you can at least try. So there we have it. That is a short little look at the BMW 230i, a, a car with actually a, a surprisingly different character to my own 130, both deeply flawed machines, but 
Uh, if I had the other, I certainly wouldn't want to upgrade to this because it's not really what it feels like. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.